Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we've got yet another Systems Design 3.0 video. Uh, this one is going to be about the Facebook like button. Now I personally have sent a lot of likes on both Facebook posts and stories in the past. Tend to also send some fire emojis with them. Uh, and maybe surprisingly, I rarely get responded to. I don't know why that is. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get into this one because I'm in a bit of a rush. Let's set up some context for this problem here. Facebook posts are visible both on the Facebook site as well as external websites. When viewing a post, a user can attach a like to it. If they've liked the post, they can dislike it. When the post comes up, there should also be an attached count of the total number of likes on the post itself. If you think about it, it's really important that when a user likes a post, and then perhaps refreshes the page, that they see their like reflected. The same applies for unliking a post that they had previously liked. On the contrary, something like the count of likes for a given post can be a little bit stale. We'll see why a trade-off like this is helpful in a bit. In a problem like this, we need to support four main API endpoints. The first is for a user to see whether or not they've liked a post. The second is for a user to like a post. Next, a user can attempt to unlike a post. And then finally, we need to be able to get the count of likes per post. By implementing these endpoints, we'll satisfy our functional requirements. Thanks to the help of ChatGPT, let me quote some pretty accurate capacity estimates here. Per day, Facebook receives around 5 billion likes across all posts. While their most popular post ever amassed 4 million likes in a day, I'll instead use Instagram's most popular post, which got over 50 million likes in 24 hours. Believe it or not, it's not a video of me twerking. What a surprise. Breaking these numbers down to a per second rate, this means that we have to handle 60,000 likes per second, with a maximum possible throughput of 600 likes per second on an individual post. The latter rate is important when determining whether we'll ever encounter a celebrity issue due to the number of clicks on a given post. The first thing that we'll cover is answering the question of whether a user has liked a given post. Because our application servers are once again stateless, we can scale them out as we please and round robin requests to them via multiple active load balancers. Note the right side of the diagram where we have a likes database. The schema here is very simple. It's just a mapping between user ID and post ID where a row in the table indicates that the user has liked a post. This is a MySQL table that can be scaled with Vitesse using the hash of the user ID. We'll be using single leader asynchronous replication for it. To check if a user has liked a post in the past, we make a request to our servers and simply check if a row for that post ID and user ID exists in our likes database. When liking or disliking a post, our servers first write or remove the like to or from the likes table. From there, we use Debezium to perform change data capture, syncing the data change to Kafka. Finally, we have a Kafka consumer group pulling these changes and applying them to our next database table, which tracks the like counts of each post. This table is called post likes count, and it lives in a distributed MongoDB cluster, which is partitioned based on the post ID. We also use a hash index per node in order to keep reads and writes to the table very fast. To get the number of likes for a given post, we first check if the result is cached in our look aside Redis cluster, which is partitioned by post ID. If not, we'll fetch the result from the post likes count MongoDB instead. Now that we've gone through our high level design, let's break down our decision making process. Keep in mind that one of the requirements of this problem is that when a user likes a post and receives an acknowledgement from our backend, the like is instantly reflected. Sometimes this is called read after write consistency. In our case, we can achieve this by devoting a simple database table to all of the likes. As long as we are always making reads from an up-to-date copy of the data, we'll see our like reflected. The schema for this table should be very simple. At its core, we really only need to reflect two fields for a like, the user ID and the post ID. In reality, there's probably a lot more metadata attached here for data analysis purposes. Even though our necessary fields can be reflected with two longs, which is equal to 16 bytes, let's conservatively estimate that each write will be around 100 bytes in total. To check whether a user has liked a post, we'll simply check whether a row exists for the given user ID and post ID combination. To like a post, we'll create that row if it doesn't exist. To delete a like, we'll remove that row if it exists. Note that because we're sending in a pretty constant stream of individual likes to our table, we probably want to be using an OLTP database here. Let's now go through how we'd get the number of likes for a given post. From our likes table, we can run a query to count all rows with a given post ID. In reality, this can get expensive. Most transactional databases aren't pre-computing the counts of rows with a certain key value, unlike some analytical ones. If we have to do a linear row scan to figure out our counts, popular posts may require scanning many gigabytes of data at once, which would take a few seconds even with really good SSDs. We could maybe use a typical Redis cache here so that we only have to perform this computation once. 
That being said, unless we configure a really short TTL, our like counts for these posts may become stale very quickly. And if we're frequently purging the cache number of likes per popular posts, that just means more slow user queries from the database. We don't want that. Instead, it may really benefit us to pre-compute the count of likes for all posts. While this may have less of a performance benefit for posts with a few likes, it can make a noticeable difference for all of these celebrity posts. Let's consider what we should do about table partitioning. These are fairly big tables. At 5 billion likes a day, each one being 100 bytes, we're writing 166 terabytes of data every single year and around a petabyte over six years. Additionally, we're handling 60,000 writes per second. Forgetting about the writes for a moment, users must fetch whether they've liked a post and the post's like count every single time that they view it. If this occurs 10 times as much as the number of likes, which come in at a rate of 60,000 per second, that's 600,000 reads per second. If we use this 10 to 1 ratio to apply to popular posts, this means that we could have some moments where hot posts are viewed by 6,000 people a second, potentially hammering the shard that those live on. Even if someone wanted to argue that we'd benefit from partitioning by post ID for computing like counts, we've already decided that we're going to fetch those from a different view. For this reason, we may prefer to use the hash of the user ID in order to determine which partition a row should live on. Unlike round robining, this allows us to easily figure out which shard to read from when determining whether a user has liked a post. It also comes with the added benefit of being able to see all of the post IDs that a user has liked. Since no user can physically like that many posts, we should get fairly balanced load across our shards here. Okay, admittedly, I like a lot of posts, but that's because I'm pretty good at gooning. It therefore seems beneficial to create an index on user ID and then post ID. This further speeds up queries to determine whether a user has liked a given post. We'll now introduce a second table, post like counts, which is responsible for keeping track of the number of likes on each post. It is a very simple schema, post ID and count, which represents the number of likes on that post. One naive way to update this table would be to do so right when a user likes a post. For starters, this would mean that we'd have hundreds of updates to the count on the same popular post. Since this is a counter, we'd need to use atomic operations to ensure that we don't lose any updates from concurrent writes. Worse yet, we're also prone to bad partial failure scenarios. The write to the likes table could go through, but the write to the post like counts table could fail, resulting in the two tables being in an inconsistent state. While we don't need the count of likes to be immediately accurate when a user reads it, we do need our two tables to be eventually consistent with one another. Recall that we need read after write consistency for our like data. That means the first place that the like needs to go is into a database. If we put it in Kafka, for example, we'd have no guarantee on when the like would be reflected back to the user. Then a user could like a post, receive an acknowledgement from our backend, refresh the page, and it could seem like their action was lost. Recall that if we try to write to two systems at once, we're prone to partial failure scenarios. For this reason, we want the likes table to be our source of truth. Once a write is in the database, we need it propagated to our post like counts table. We can accomplish this with something known as change data capture. CDC, as it's called for short, hooks into the replication log of a database and syncs it to Kafka. One tool that allows you to do this with a wide variety of databases is called Debezium. Personally, I'm not a big fan of sifting through other people's logs, but to each their own. Since the replication log is itself durable and messages in Kafka are durable when configured properly, we know that even if database failures are present, we should expect to eventually see them in Kafka. From there, we can have a Kafka consumer that takes in those messages and syncs them to the post likes count table. In our likes table, we need read your write consistency. This probably means that we want to avoid using something like multi-leader replication. This is because a user could send a like to one of our database leaders and then read from another and not see their like reflected. In theory, we've actually got a couple of options here. We could use leaderless replication. If we use quorum consistency, we can guarantee that the set of database nodes that we write to and read from will always overlap. This means that we'll have an up-to-date value for each key on at least one of the nodes that we read from and can use client-assigned write timestamps to determine which one is the most recent. The other is to use single leader replication. As long as we always read from our single leader, we'll be sure to see any likes that we've made. Note that assuming this replication is asynchronous, we can lose some data due to failovers as it may not have reached the replica before our leader fails. Recall that we're going to use Debezium to sync the data from the likes table to a change data stream. If we were to use Cassandra and go with leaderless replication, it becomes a little bit more complex. CDC on Cassandra requires reading from many different replicas because the working set of data for one partition can potentially live across many different nodes. 
While this could work, let's just keep things simple and stick to a typical SQL database for our likes table. We can sync the change data from a node in each shard into Kafka. Because we'll be creating tens of thousands of likes per second, we probably want to have multiple partitions of our change data Kafka topic. Recall that our likes table is partitioned on user ID. That being said, if we have our change data topic partitioned by user ID, multiple consumers will be writing data for the same post in our sync table, and will therefore be experiencing lock contention with one another, especially for popular posts. Instead, it would be ideal if all likes for a given post were handled by the same Kafka consumer. The default behavior of Debezium is to use a primary key of the database in order to route information to a Kafka partition. However, we can override this using a single message transform, or SMT for short. In our case, we'll use the hash of the post ID, modulo the number of Kafka partitions. Because even the most popular posts are only receiving a few hundred likes per second, a few partitions of a Kafka topic can still easily keep up with this write load. We don't need to worry about the celebrity problem here. In our derived view, we need to ensure that each click is processed exactly once. In terms of ensuring that each click is handled at least once, recall that messages in Kafka are durable. We'll use multiple Kafka consumers in a consumer group to ensure that all messages are handled even if one of the consumer nodes fails. Let's also go over how we can ensure that each message is processed at most once. The technique for doing so is very reminiscent of our prior video about add click aggregation. Simply put, we should store a Kafka partition and offset number alongside each row so that we'll only incorporate updates to the table that we haven't yet seen. Each incoming like is treated as a plus one, and each deletion of a like is treated as a minus one. If we want, we can even batch those updates in our consumer to minimize database writes and achieve better write throughput for popular posts. We just need to first check the post like count table to see the last processed Kafka offset for a given post, which tells us which events from our change data stream to include and which to drop. At the end of the day, we still need fast reads. Posts are likely viewed in order of magnitude more than they are liked, and we'll need to load a post like counts for all of those views. For this reason, we can use a very simple look aside Redis cache. Our application servers will first check the cache for the data. In the event of a cache miss, they'll fetch the true result from the database and place it in our Redis cache. Redis can handle hundreds of thousands of simple reads per second, meaning that we really have no need to be concerned about hot shards here. We can keep our TTLs in the span of minutes to ensure that our data doesn't get too stale and use an LRU eviction policy since we don't know which posts will be popular in advance. Much of the interesting part of this video, in my opinion, is learning why we should be using change data capture as a way of maintaining derived data views. We can use Debezium to get all changes in a persistent store, so that in theory, our derived view should be eventually consistent with our main view. First, we'll discuss whether that's actually the case. Next, we'll discuss whether there's any way to avoid change data capture in the first place. Imagine a situation where we have Debezium reading from the replication log of a primary database, where the database is doing asynchronous replication to a follower. We have a race condition here. Debezium can send a write from the replication log to Kafka before any follower node applies it, and then the leader can go down. The write will then be lost when a replica takes over as the primary database, but it will be reflected in our derived view because it is in Kafka. Now, our views will never be totally consistent with one another. There are two fairly easy ways to ensure that our derived view is always consistent with the primary table. The first is to use a strongly consistent database. That way, writes can never be lost. Many OLTP databases these days use consensus algorithms to create a distributed log of writes, allowing them to be strongly consistent while also still tolerating some node failures. Some of these include Google Spanner and CockroachDB. In theory, this may lower our write throughput into the likes table, but these databases can be scaled at horizontally enough that it shouldn't matter too much. Another option would be to actually create our database replicas from the change data capture Kafka topic. That way, we'd ensure that Kafka is the source of truth for a replication log, and any replica that becomes the primary after a leader failure would have seen the same messages as any derived views. I'm not aware of any databases that use CDC as their replication mechanism, so we'd have to rebuild the failover logic ourselves, which would make life a lot more complex. Let's think if we have any other options that avoid a bunch of custom code and don't require consensus algorithms in the critical path. Recall that we want to ensure that every write that has been sent to the CDC topic has been successfully replicated. A pretty easy way to do this would just be to run Debezium on a replica. This isn't supported by every database that has a Debezium connector, but one that does work, for example, is MySQL. Again, there are some subtleties here. Imagine that we're running Debezium on a replica, but then on a failover, a less up-to-date replica is chosen to be the new leader, and some of the writes on our Debezium replica are now lost. 
We can avoid this by ensuring that we always choose the most up-to-date replica during a leader failover. There are many MySQL replication tools that can do this, for example, Orchestrator. Note that when we do so, if the new leader was the replica running the Debezium connector, we'd now need to point Debezium to a different replica. Fortunately, Orchestrator can actually hit a webhook upon a failover to alert us that this has happened. If it does, we can run some custom logic where we ask Orchestrator for the addresses of the followers and configure our Debezium connector to point to one of those. Debezium has logic to resume from its last committed replication log offset, so we should be good to go. Is it really worth it to do this? Honestly, probably not. Again, there's a lot of custom code here, and it's definitely possible that I missed some race conditions. For example, the primary node could send data to our Debezium replica, have it persisted to Kafka, and then both of them could go down. Now, the data would be lost, but still reflected in our derived view. Recall that all of our APIs can be implemented pretty easily if we just have a single primary data store that is partitioned based on the post ID. The main issue that we run into is that counting rows with a given ID requires a scan of the table, and many users will be doing this to fetch the light counts for popular posts to the tune of 6,000 operations per second. For these popular posts, we may be able to actually pretty easily solve things with Redis. Let's model our data as post ID as the Redis key, and a set of user IDs as the Redis value. Since Redis is just using a normal hash set, computing the cardinality of it is O of 1. The actual amount of data stored for a given post, even super popular ones, is just in the few gigabyte range, certainly enough to keep in memory. Individual nodes can handle hundreds of thousands of simple operations per second, so we don't really need to worry about things from a throughput perspective. If we're concerned that there are too many Redis nodes and things get expensive, we could always store just the posts of verified users on Redis, and if otherwise, store them in a normal transactional database. Well guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. As you can see, uh, we're starting to kind of build upon the concepts uh, from episode to episode. Did a lot of, you know, exactly once processing in the prior episode and also kind of dancing around the line of CDC. So I think in this video, it's a good one to talk about kind of change data capture in general and the nuances of it. The reason I'm doing so is because in the next video, we're probably going to do uh, like a newsfeed systems design. And I don't want to spend, you know, 20 plus minutes talking about you know, uh, building both a following and followers table, uh, which need to use change data capture to keep one another in sync. Uh, so yeah, hopefully this is useful. I will see you all in the next one, and I'm looking forward to it.